you're not familiar totally with the book of Acts, Acts only has 28 chapters, so we are very close to the end of the book. We'll be reading verses 20 through 26 today. Acts 27, starting at verse 20, says this, Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your perfect plan. And though we do not always understand it very clearly... I praise you that you are always in control and that your plan is always good. We pray we would see these things today. We pray that Jesus would be lifted up today and that those who do not yet trust him as Lord, this will be the day they do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I've learned to do a lot of things in life, but of all the things I've learned to do, the one thing I learned that I am not cut out to do is to be a sailor. (laughs) The few times I've been on a boat in deep water, I've inevitably gotten seasick. I've got a a lot of respect for Navy sailors and Marines out there, but I, I know that even in my younger days, I could never have been one of them. You know, it's one thing, I I love being on a lake when the water is smooth in a a sailing vessel like that. Light sailing can be a joy. Things are smooth, things are easy. It's when that massive ship starts getting tossed, my stomach does the same thing. (laughs) Now, obviously, that could be a metaphor for a lot of things in life. We like it when things are easy. We like it when things are comfortable. It's when life gets rough that we get worried. The days of smooth sailing are nice. It's the days of storm that are days of trouble and concern. That's normal. We run into problems, so when we expect life to be nothing but ease and comfort. It's been often said nobody promised life was going to be easy, but somehow that's our expectation. And I would suggest that's our expectation, probably wrongly so, but especially as Christians. So many people come to Christ with the false expectation. They're told something like this, just give your heart to Jesus and life will be good. Give your heart to Jesus, things are going to be easy, you'll experience happiness every day. And even if it's not explicitly stated, that's often what's implied. Just stay in the center of God's will, and if you're in the center of God's will, everything's going to be okay. It's when you get outside of God's will that you run into trouble. Now, that on the surface sounds right, and you might even be able to find certain verses in the Bible that seem to argue for that point of view, but I would suggest when you do, you'll find that At best, those verses are out of context, and at worst, your interpretation is downright wrong. God's will for us isn't always easy. It doesn't always include smooth sailing. Just ask Moses as he dealt with a nation of constantly complaining Israelites. It wasn't easy on him. Just ask Jeremiah, who faithfully preached God's word and yet was still imprisoned for it in God's nation. And of course, we could ask Jesus, who was 100% faithful to God's will 100% of the time, and he still faced rejection, physical torture, and the cross. God's will by no means guarantees comfort, although God's will is always going to be ultimately for his good and his glory. We see another example of that with the Apostle Paul as the book of Acts starts to come to a close. Finally, Paul is on his way to Rome to preach the gospel. Of course, he's still in custody, still in prison, but he's on his way to Rome, and this was God's perfect will for him, but what we see is that it didn't come easy. Paul experienced great difficulties, and it was those same difficulties that God used to testify of his perfect power and his sovereign will to everybody who's around Paul. God's will for Paul was not for smooth sailing, but it was for good. How do we get here? Well, remember, after Paul's arrest in Jerusalem, which followed three full-fledged missionary journeys. Paul stood trial not just once, but four times. Over and over again, he proved that he's innocent of any crime against Rome. The only thing he's gladly guilty of was the gospel. 
He believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Jewish Messiah, risen from the dead. And because he is, we can all have hope in our future resurrection and eternal life. That was the message that Paul preached throughout the Roman Empire in front of the Jews of Jerusalem, to governors, to kings, other officials. He never wavered in his faith, never wavered in his preaching, no matter to whom it was that he spoke. And the last example we saw of this was to King Herod Agrippa II, who heard Paul's case at the request of the Roman governor Festus. And because Festus had delayed Paul's acquittal yet again, Paul had used his right as a Roman citizen to appeal to Caesar. Festus had hoped that Agrippa might find a legal justification for his own failure to act, but in the end, Agrippa agreed with Paul about the legalities, if not at least the gospel. Now this done, Paul set to go to Rome to see Caesar himself. And all the way, although the, the way that this all came to pass was because of injustice done by the governors Felix and Festus, the fact that it came to pass was by the will of God. We need to remember that over two years earlier, when Paul had his first trial in front of the Jewish Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, Jesus told him this would happen. Back in Acts 23, verse 11, we read this, But the following night the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified me of, uh, for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. The words of Jesus. There's no doubt whatsoever that Paul would testify of Jesus in Rome. So the only question, at least from Paul's perspective, was when and how it would take place. Those questions start to get answered in Acts 27 as Luke narrates this dangerous sailing journey from Caesarea to Rome, and although the trip to Rome isn't quite yet complete at the end of the chapter. Paul's travel is not going to be easy, but it would be successful. Why? Because this was the will of God for him, and nothing can stop the plan of God. Amen. Often, we think that when we're in the middle of God's will, things and life is going to be easy. As long as we do what God wants us to do, things are going to be comfortable. But from Paul's experience, and virtually everybody else in the Bible, including the Lord Jesus, that just isn't the case. God's perfect will for us isn't always easy, but it's always good. It will always be done because nothing can stop the plan of God. Amen. Now, as for Paul, we're going to see this here in the three basic phases of his journey, starting from his rough beginning, the storm at sea, and even a shipwreck at the end. Again, all part of God's plan, not just for Paul, but for everybody who's around him. Through Paul's witness, they too would see the work and the plan of God. They would see it begin, they'd see it in action, they'd see it fulfilled. How is God going to use you to demonstrate his plan to everybody else around you? You might never know until you decide to trust Jesus in the middle of your storm. So let's look at Acts 27. It starts with a difficult beginning in verses 1 through 12. This is where we see God's plan begun. Verse 1, And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So entering a ship of Adramitium, uh, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coasts of Asia. Aristarchus of Macedonia Thessalonica was with us, and the next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. So he's saying here that he set up from Caesarea and just started up the coast. They first landed there at Sidon. Now, what we're going to find is that the vessel they're in is a temporary vessel. It's large enough to start the journey until they can get to a larger port, get in a bigger ship that's you know, more sturdy to sail across the Mediterranean Sea to get to Rome. Uh, first trip is Sidon, just a quick jaunt from uh, Caesarea, and that's likely where more crew was bought on, brought on board. Now, you might notice that along with Paul were Luke. Now, Luke doesn't mention himself by name, but you notice the first person, plural, we. That's the writer. So Luke is with him along with Aristarchus. Now, we might remember Aristarchus from his mentions in Acts 19 and Acts 20, and he had traveled with Paul on occasion. Normally, prisoners were not allowed to have travel companions, but due to the fact that Paul was a Roman citizen and he had an appointment with Caesar, well, a few exceptions were made. So you've got Luke with him. Luke is, of course, Paul's personal physician. That's a medical necessity. And Aristarchus was probably viewed as Paul's personal slave or a servant. That would have been acceptable in the time. The reality, obviously, was different. No legal bondage between them. But in any case, Paul's not traveling alone, and that probably made the journey a lot better for him. Additionally, you might notice that Paul's given at least a limited amount of freedom by the centurion in charge, Julius. Uh, when they're inside, and Paul's allowed to have time to go visit the other Christians who are there. 
You say, well, this is a pretty good start to the journey. It's starting out pretty well for Paul. Well, yes, it was. It wouldn't last that way. Look at verse 4. When we put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. When we had sailed slowly many days and arrived with difficulty off of Canidus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off Salmone. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lassia. So the initial sailing, even though they set, place, uh, set at many ports, it wasn't easy. They go up the coastline a bit. They have trouble from the beginning. You might notice the number of times that Luke describes the journey as being difficult. Those winds off Canadus were contrary. Or excuse me, off Cyprus were contrary. They had difficulty off Canadus. They had more difficulty getting to Fair Havens. A lot of difficulties getting started. You say, well, God must be closing doors. Didn't God want Paul to go to Rome? He's making it so difficult for him to get there. Well, yeah, he wanted Paul to go to Rome. Jesus specifically promised him that he would testify there to Caesar. But he never once said the journey would be easy. God's will for Paul was for Paul to go. And you know what? God's preparing him for the difficulties that he's going to experience once he gets there as well. Sometimes God does not deliver us from the trials. Sometimes he uses those trials to be the things to deliver us. Sometimes he uses the smaller difficulties to prepare us for the larger ones. It doesn't mean we've done anything wrong. I'm running into trouble. I must be doing something out of God's will. Not necessarily. It means we need to continue to trust the Lord as he works these things out for his glory. Look at verse 9. Now, when much time had been spent and the sailing was now dangerous because of the fast... And speaking of the Day of Atonement, by the way, because the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Paul warned here of imminent danger. Now, some asked the question, was this prophecy or was this wisdom? Now, some insist this is prophetic, but it seems more likely that this is wisdom from a, a highly experienced traveler, because although Paul said lives would be lost, we know no lives were lost. So this does not seem to be prophetic. But this does come from somebody, Paul speaking, who had already been shipwrecked three different times, as he wrote in 2 Corinthians 11.25. Uh, he wasn't some novice to sailing. He knew exactly what could take place there. You know, prophecy would be given to Paul later on in the journey, but here he's just passing on his wise counsel. Let's not head out now. This is going to end like the other three times, and I don't like swimming that much. Uh, but, you know, his counsel is ignored. Look at verse 11. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman, the owner of the ship, than by the thing spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also. If by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete opening toward the southwest and the northwest and winters there. So the crew's response is that they overruled and they outvoted Paul. Uh, the centurion, the Roman centurion, is the highest ranking Roman official among them. So he has a final decision. Paul had argued that it'd be better to stay the winter months where they were. And it would be a long time, weeks to months. And that's not uncommon in the ancient world. You know, we think of an airport weather delay hanging out in LaGuardia Airport in New York all night long as a bad thing. I've been there. It is a bad thing. You don't want to be there for that long. But they would be there for, weather, or for, for months at a time. The ship's pilot, the ship's owner, thought it'd be better to move just up the port just a little way from, you can see it on the map there, it wasn't all that far from Fair Havens to Phoenix. That was a better city to stay in. You settle down, hunker down there for a while. Now, keep in mind, before we go on, this wasn't necessarily sin on their part. These sailors had logical reasons for their argument, even if Paul had better reasons to stay put. It just didn't work out very well for them. Disagreements aren't always sin, which require repentance. Someone can be wrong without evil intent, and that was likely the case here. But this is the beginning. It was a difficult start to the trip, but it didn't change the fact that God's plan was already in motion. God's plan had begun. Now, there's a lot of human elements at work. People are arguing back and forth with one another, but God is over all of this. God is directing all of this. Although the crew and the members, they didn't give Paul too much credence at first, guess what? By the end, they'd be hanging on Paul's every word, and by extension, they would be listening to the words of God that Paul spoke to them. 
Again, difficult beginnings don't mean we're not in the will of God. They may be exactly God's will for us at the time. If we're walking with Jesus in faith, it means we need to trust him in faith wherever he leads us, even if the places that he leads us don't seem too comfortable at the time. We need to trust that his plan has begun and that he's going to put it into action. And that's what we see next in the larger section here with the storm at sea, verses 13 through 38. This is God's plan in action. So let's see how this starts. Verse 13, when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurycladon. And when the ship was caught, they could not head into the wind. We let her drive. Luke's describing a massive storm of some sort. It might be legitimately referred to as a nor'easter, considering that Eurycladon is a Greek-Latin hybrid word uh, comprised of the Greek word for east and the Latin word for north. Um, but the specific, when you hear nor'easter is being described by meteorologists today, it describes a specific hurricane-like storm off the northeastern coast of North America. Obviously, Luke did not have access to modern uh, meteorological terminology. So we don't know exactly know what this storm was as experienced by the crew. What we do know is that the storm was bad enough and well-known enough that they had their own name for it, mm -hmm. right? So this was a bad thing that they were encountering, probably hurricane gale force like winds. And you can understand how this would cause problems. And they described some of these problems starting in verse 16. And running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secure the skiff with difficulty. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship, and fearing lest they should run aground on the Sirtis sands, they struck sail and were so driven. And because we were so exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. The third day we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands, describing some really drastic measures here. So bad is this storm that the, that the crew had to take care to secure the skiff. The skiff is that small rowboat that you use to get between the ship and the shore. They even use special ropes to go underneath the vessel itself to try to bind these boards together so the ship doesn't literally break apart while they're on the water. And with all that done, they're still being driven by the storm. They don't have really any control over the ship and their direction at this point, driving towards this dangerous area, these Sirtis Sands, an area that's known to run ships aground, and so they need to lighten the ship even more so we don't drag those sands. So they start throwing things overboard, right? They, they toss the ship's tackle underboard. I don't know how many sailors here even know what tackle is other than a football player getting thrown to the ground. That's not this tackle. We're talking about the rigging. We're talking about the ropes used to secure the sails, to a low cargo, that sort of thing. This is not exactly optional equipment. You need that stuff on board, but they need to lighten the vessel as much as they can so you can understand how bad things have gotten when they start throwing the tackle overboard. Let's lighten this up as much as possible. Look at verse 20. Now, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally lost. Hope was lost, and we can easily imagine why. There they are. They're tossed to and fro in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. They can't see anything but water on all sides, and they're wildly off course. They've got no way of gathering their bearings. They don't have GPS. They don't have sat phones and locator beacons or anything like that. All they had were the stars, but what did they have instead of stars? They had clouds covering them day and night because they're in the middle of a storm. They've got zero way of gathering their bearings. They've lost all sense of direction, and they're adrift in this sea headed towards dangerous areas. It's really easy to lose hope. It's really easy to start thinking death is inevitable. Now, without wanting to take this too far from its context, you don't have to be in the middle of a hurricane on a boat that's about to be ripped apart or you start losing hope of being saved. There are days that our everyday life seems like that. You're going along well one day and then the next day your job takes a hit, your health takes a hit, your enemies come out of the woodwork. It doesn't take long to make you feel like you're drowning. What do you do in the middle of all of that? And you have no bearing whatsoever. Now, for the Christian, praise God, we have Jesus Christ because we have a foundation there. We can look to Christ. We can uh, rely on the strength that he provides. We know that he's in control. We have at least some foundation. But I feel really bad for those who aren't Christians 
What about for the people who don't know Jesus? They have no lifeline. They have no safeguard. They have no foundation in the midst of a storm. They might have certain beliefs about God, but without having Jesus, they don't have a true relationship with the God of the universe. And if they trust only themselves, then they have no hope of being saved. Here's the good news. Hope can be had, but it's only available through Christ. Not through other religions, not through ourselves not through our abilities or our intellect. It's only through the authority and the grace of Jesus that we can be saved. He's our hope. We need to trust him. These men had lost hope. Let's pick back up in the narrative, verse 21. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and lost. I, I really love this part. Some scholars have gone to great lengths to argue that by no means was Paul being, you know, petty and engaging in an I told you so situation. Now, I don't think Paul was engaging in pettiness, but the text seems to leave little doubt that he did have a little bit of an I told you so moment. We need to understand that not every word ever spoken by Paul was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, His letters do show a slight tendency towards sarcasm, which some of us appreciate to a great extent. It would seem that he has a little bit of the same thing going on here. Now, I, I don't want to say that this reflects poorly on Paul because it doesn't. This, this reflects him as a human being with normal feelings and normal reactions. Any one of us would have been annoyed if our advice is ignored, right? As was Paul's regarding the best time to sail. And considering these massive difficulties they experienced as a result, it's only natural for Paul to say, man, you should have listened to me. They should have listened to him. Isn't it good to know that Paul and the other apostles were just regular guys? Mm -hmm. We tend to have these image of these biblical characters as if they're walking on air, always surrounded by the glowing halo like all the old paintings, and they're somehow more holy on this higher level than the rest of us, and that's not true at all. These biblical people were just men and women. They were just sinners saved by grace. Like you, like me, they were just people. They laughed, they cried, they mourned, they got ticked off, they got annoyed. Sometimes they did it when relying on the grace of God. Sometimes they didn't. Other times they needed to seek God's forgiveness, just like the rest of us. Now, was Paul's I told you so his best example of personal holiness? Probably not, but it's a great example of his humanity. Beloved, we aren't perfect. We'll never be perfect. God sees us as perfect. There's only one reason, because we're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. If it's not for Jesus, we're just rotten sinners. Jesus and his grace, they make all the difference in the world. So if this was all Paul had to say, we might have room to criticize him. But thankfully, he has much more to say. I told you so, but, verse 22, And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and to whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe, God, that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. See, Paul had been given a prophetic word of protection from Almighty God. An angel had appeared by night, and angels did what angels did. They delivered messengers, the messages. That's literally what the word means. It's a messenger. So this angel delivered a message from God of hope of salvation. God's plan for Paul, we know, was to live. He has to be active. Paul has to appear before Caesar in Rome, so we know Paul is going to survive to see that day. God assures him of that. But in addition, there's more good news. God had mercy on all who would sail with Paul. They would all be saved. Please notice the specific condition of the physical salvation. God has granted you all those who sail with you. God has granted you all those who sail with you. God did not grant the lives of the crew and the others to them themselves. God granted those lives to Paul. Additionally, it was those who sailed with Paul. So anyone who abandoned Paul or worked against Paul, they had no guarantee of safety. God promised deliverance to anyone who remained with Paul for Paul's sake, not their own. Now, let's draw a parallel here, because similarly, this is what happens with us in Christ. Why is it that God would have mercy on us, being that we are the sinners that we are? And we are huge sinners. There's one reason, one reason only. We are covered by Jesus. Because we are with him, 
in relationship to him through faith, God has mercy on us. Not for our sake, for Jesus' sake. Just like the sailor's only hope of salvation was to stay with Paul, so our only hope of salvation from eternal punishment is to stay with Jesus because God has kindness on Jesus, thus he extends his kindness to us. The question then becomes, are you with Jesus? Because he's the only hope that we have of being saved. Now, the promise is for protection. Everybody's going to live. Please notice there are still difficulties yet ahead. Something else is prophesied in verse 26. We must run aground on a certain island. Now, normally, from a sailor's perspective, that's a very undesirable outcome. But from another perspective, it would be very helpful. And you say, well, how so? Because running aground provides physical data that confirms the prophecy. Normally, if a ship runs aground, the crew would pan it for loss of life. This time, when they ran aground, it would be proof, hey, this is what God said would happen. God's word is being fulfilled to the letter. Salvation would come to all. It was good news when this would happen. Watch for this to happen because that means you're on the cusp of being saved. Verse 27, now when the 14th night had come, as we were driven up and down the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were drawing near some land. By the way, some people get confused because... The Adriatic Sea tends to, in modern times, refer to only this area between Italy and Greece, Macedonia. Uh, obviously, that's not where Paul and Luke and the others were. Uh, in the day, they really thought of the Adriatic Sea or even the Sea of Hadrian sometimes, referring to this area between Italy and, and Africa. Um, there's been some people that use some of Luke's labels to cast doubt on historicity, but considering everything else he said is proven to be true to the exact label that he used, we need to give Luke the benefit of the doubt. Uh, the Bible is always going to prove itself true. Uh, anyway, that's where they were, verse 28. They took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. When they got a little further, they took soundings again and found it to be 15 fathoms. So things are getting more and more shallow. Then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. What do we see here? We see the prophecy being tested. Paul said that the ship would run aground, and by the measurements of the sailors, that increasingly seemed to be the case. The further they sailed, the more shallow the waters become. Running aground seemed inevitable. Not that this provided much comfort. It should have, but it didn't. Sailors didn't want to run aground too soon. They dropped four anchors from the stern. They're trying to lighten the ship, ship yet again. Now, they've got this initial evidence that Paul's prophecy is being fulfilled, but they didn't yet want to believe it to be God's provision. See, the words are coming true before the rise, but they're still doing everything they can to avoid putting faith in God. Yeah. Isn't that so often the reaction people have to the Word of God? Yeah. We see the things of God that He's told us coming true around us, but people still run from the Lord. Better to trust God. Verse 30, and as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they let down the skiff into the sea, under the pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay on the ship, you cannot be saved. And the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall off. So this prophecy is tested again in a, in, a, in a good, not really in a good way. Some of the sailors, knowing what's about to happen, they thought, you know, at least we can save ourselves in this light boat and make our way to some shore, let everybody else perish on the ship. So they take this skiff, the, the, the smaller rowboat, that had earlier been secured to the ship, and they attempt to escape. That's when Paul takes notice, speaks up. God had mercifully granted the life of everybody who traveled with Paul, but that's based on the provision that they believe Paul. They believe this prophecy that he preached. They didn't leave him. They didn't abandon him to die. Can we go to this one? This point is going to be all or nothing. All or nothing. Either the men stay to be saved according to God's word, or no guarantee would be given to anyone. So that's when the centurion, remember, he ranks higher than the ship's captain. He takes control. He has a skiff cut away, basically burning all bridges for any other form of escape. You say, that's drastic action. Maybe, but it got the point across. They would be committed to the word that was preached through Paul. If their only hope is in the God that Paul proclaimed, then that's where they needed to place their trust. They couldn't afford to give themselves any other way out. Now let's think about how true this is for us. Our only hope is in Christ Jesus. We cannot leave ourselves any other option. 
If we try to take another way, we cannot be saved. If we try to take another way, we don't really have faith. We will not be saved. We'll see how it picks up again in verse 33. And as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day you've waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment, for this is your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. Now, to this point, though the prophecy had been tested, people didn't really believe it. God had promised their safety, but they're acting as if they need to depend on themselves to be saved. We're going to take this skiff. I'm going to say myself. We're going to do this. I'm going to say myself. No, they were acting as if they were dependent on themselves, despite what Paul had said. And you see it here. They didn't just ration out food to last as long as possible. They weren't eating at all. This is a sign they were depending on themselves to get saved. How so? Because they were fasting, not for safety, but out of sorrow. They were fasting, really, this was the practice that they were using to the gods that they worshipped would grant them favor if they showed themselves sorry enough and fasted long enough, and then, you know, just the universe would turn towards them. That's the line of thinking going on here. Although God was proving himself true, they did not yet trust him. They could see his work. Oh, these, you know, soundings are getting shallower and shallower, but they needed to do more than just see his work. They needed to believe his word. And Paul implored them to put feet to their faith and act according to the promise of salvation. If they trusted the God of Paul's preaching, if they trusted the God that Paul worshipped to save them, then they should eat. God promised them life, so they need to take steps to live. Especially if they had to abandon ship at some point, which at verse 26, Paul said you would need to do. They need to have strength to survive in the water. So eating wasn't just a necessity. It was a step of faith to put their trust and the word of the true God. So what happened, verse 35, when they, he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and also took food for themselves. And in all, we were 276 persons on the ship. So when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat into the sea. So Paul's prophecy now finally believed. Now he takes the first step. He sets the example. Everybody else follows. They eat And then they get rid of the wheat. You say, what good did that do? You got rid of all your food. Was this one more lapse of faith? Not this time. This time, this was a commitment to trust the word of God spoken through the apostle. Now, they've thrown things overboard already to line the ship. But although the sailors were willing to get rid of uh, essential tools for the sailing vessel, to this point, they weren't yet willing to give up the cargo. They think that if they can at least preserve the cargo, then at least, you know, the voyage wouldn't be a total loss. Yet God, through Paul, had promised that only the lives of the people, not the ship. The ship would be lost, verse 22. So if the ship's going to be lost, so is the cargo. At this point, they finally believe the word of God. They jettison the cargo, putting all their trust in the promise that their lives alone would be saved. So as when they finally ate some food, they put feet to their faith and they acted on the promise of God. Guys, if we truly believe something, we act on it. If you believe that a knee replacement surgery is going to relieve your pain, then you're going to get the surgery, even though it requires putting your knee through further additional trauma you wouldn't otherwise experience. And having your leg sliced open to have a knee replacement put in can't be described as anything else but trauma. (laughs) Yet because you trust your surgeon... You willingly elect to let him or her do the surgery. You believed it, so you did it. That's what true faith looks like. If you really believe that Jesus is the only way to be saved, then Jesus is going to be your only hope of salvation. You're not going to trust your good works. You're not going to trust your financial giving. You're not going to trust your good tensions or anything like that. You'll trust Jesus alone because you believe Jesus alone. If you don't believe him, then you won't trust him. You won't act in faith according to his word. Now, although it might have been difficult to see at the time, right here, this is the plan of God. Yes, there was a storm. Yes, there was going to be tremendous loss, but there would be no loss of life as long as the men trusted the word of God and acted according to it. God is at work even in the storm. He shows himself powerfully in control. Choice was up to those who sailed if they would trust God to see them through. You might need to ask yourself if you trust him the same way. There aren't many guarantees in life, but there's one thing guaranteed true of all of us. God right now is in control. God is at work. 
God's plan is being fulfilled. Whether we recognize him or not is not the point. It doesn't change the fact that God is sovereign over all things. God is sovereign over the atheists who don't even believe he exists. God is sovereign even over people of other religions who worship false gods. God is sovereign over Christians who are blind to the work of their father that they claim. God is sovereign. He's working throughout all the world, even among those who reject him. So the choice is yours. Will you trust the plan of God who controls all things, or are you just going to trust yourself? Because you think you can control all things in your realm of influence, but when reality, we control nothing. We want to trust the active, the living God. So God's plan had begun. It was at work. It's also going to be brought to completion. We see it in this shipwreck and their, their salvation, their physical salvation through the end of the chapter. God's plan is fulfilled. Verse 39, when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay with a beach onto which they planned to run the ship if possible. And they let go the anchors and left them in the sea, meanwhile loosing the rudder ropes, and they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for shore. But striking a place where the two seas met, they ran the ship aground. The prow stuck fast and remained immovable, but the stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves. So the ship ran aground. Again, normally this is a terrible thing, but this is wonderful because the prophecy is being proven true. What God said would happen was happening. God's word is always true. The ship is going to be lost. Other people are going to be saved. Praise God. Let's go. Verse 42, and the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land, and the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped safely to land. Now, from the soldier's perspective at the time, killing the prisoners was actually life-saving to themselves. Rome held guards personally responsible for the escape of any prisoners in their care. So if some of the men swam to safety and they got away, then the soldiers themselves might be cast into prison or killed. And that's why they're prepared to kill every single prisoner on board. Now, one problem with that, among many, one problem is that, you know, that wasn't the promise of God. God said everybody needed to be with Paul. So that's when the centurion stepped in. The centurion here demonstrates faith. He believed the promise of God even when others under his command did not. So he goes so far as to ensure that even those who can't swim still have a way to get to the land once they're in the water. At this point, his trust was in the God that Paul served, seen in his action, and the end result is they all lived. Exactly as God said that they would. What do we see here in the escape? We see God's plan fulfilled. With the prophecy fulfilled, God saw, excuse me, the people saw God's plan fulfilled. They saw that God really did have a plan for Paul to be in Rome, to Caesar, and they themselves, the fact that they lived through this event, were the proof. Because there was zero reason for any of them to have escaped safely to land. Not a one of them could argue otherwise. They had sailing difficulties from the beginning. They got stuck in this hurricane-like situation. They lose control of the ship. They lost the ship itself. None of them should have survived, much less all of them. It might be believable that, you know, a few survivors make their way off and, and make it to land, but all of them, 276 people, that's unthinkable, yet that's exactly what happened. Why? Because that was a plan of God in motion. That was the grace of God displayed. What God wants done gets done. I hope you believe it. It wasn't an easy journey, but it was eventually a successful one. Now, the crew landed on what they eventually learned was the island of Malta. It's from there they'd eventually make it to Rome. Again, lots of difficulties on the way to the point where people had lost hope of life and they were prepared for death. But what did they see in it? They saw the plan, the provision of God, the God whom Paul preached. Because God had a plan to use Paul to preach the gospel of Jesus in Rome, all who were with Paul had a chance to see God in action. Not once in this tempest and storm had God lost control, even when all the people had lost hope. So the God who rescued them from the storm could rescue them from all things, including eternal death itself. Now, before we close out, it's interesting to me that we never read directly of the faith of the centurion, the captain, the crew, or any of the other 276 people on board the ship. We see evidence how they eventually believe the, the prophecies of Paul, but nothing is said of the gospel. 
Nothing said of these sailors coming to faith in Christ. And we might ask if Paul and Luke and Aristarchus had stayed silent the entire time, had they said nothing of Jesus. That's doubtful. If there's anything we've learned about Paul through the book of Acts is that he preached Jesus at every opportunity. And when you're stuck on ship at sea for two weeks with a bunch of people staring death in the face, you don't really have a much more opportune time to preach Jesus. Now, we don't read of anyone coming to faith in Christ. Certainly, there were at least a few who, who did. And why wouldn't they? Jesus had proven himself true. Jesus' plans for Paul were fulfilled, and no tempest, hurricane, nor Easter, whatever you want to call it, could stop what he wanted done. See, this is a God that was more powerful than the storm. This was a God worthy of worship. In fact, we could probably argue that this was the reason that God allowed Paul to endure this not-so-smooth sailing trip in the first place. God was not taken by surprise by the storms. He knew those storms would come, and he allowed Paul to go through them anyway. Why? Because he knew he would deliver Paul through the storm as well as everyone else on board. Even the storm at sea testified of the God who saves. God can use your storms in the same way. Has your life become increasingly uncomfortable? Are you in the middle of a tempest? You know, those are the things we expect when we've done something wrong. Because we're, you know, we're experiencing, experiencing the consequences of sinful choices. But sometimes those are the things we experience when we've done everything right. We can be 100% in the will of God and still experience storms. So the question at that point becomes, what is it that God wants to do in this storm? How does God want to show himself? How does he want to demonstrate his grace? See, God hasn't lost his goodness when things come uncomfortable for you. He hasn't lost his power in allowing you to endure what you're enduring. He wants to show you his power and his grace in a different way. He wants you to know that his grace is always sufficient and that Jesus is Lord, not only in the smooth sailing, but also in the storms. And when you learn that lesson... <laughs> That's something you can testify to everybody else around you. Now, maybe you're here and you're not experiencing the storms of life with the faith of a Paul or of a Luke or an Aristarchus. You're facing them with the perspective of the rest of the guys on board the ship. Maybe you're at the point of losing hope and giving up. Might I suggest that could turn into a good thing? We need to lose hope in our abilities to save ourselves. We have to put all hope in Jesus and his ability to save us. Jesus is Lord of the storms as well as he is of the smooth sailing. And maybe this storm, this trial in your life is exactly what's needed for you to put your hope, your trust, your faith alone in Jesus. And you have the opportunity to do that right now as we pray. Father, I thank you so much that you are sovereign over all things. There's not a, a, a circumstance that comes into our life of which you are not aware and even of which you have not allowed. You are truly sovereign. And so, Lord, I, I would pray for those who are struggling with trials and difficulties, maybe sicknesses, maybe all kinds of just tragedies in their lives, that you would show yourself strong on their behalf for your glory and that their trust would be in you. Particularly, Lord, for those who have not yet trusted you as Lord and King. Help them see themselves as utterly hopeless without you, for we are hopeless without you. We cannot be saved. We cannot save ourselves. We need Jesus to save us and help them see themselves as desperate for you and let them now put all their hope in the Jesus who died for them at the cross, who rose from the grave, who offers life, forgiveness, and salvation to everyone who trusts him as Lord. So Lord, help them receive you now in their heart. Help them turn away from their sins and trust you with everything. And Lord, help us not stop trusting you with everything just because we once put our faith in Christ. Lord, we love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.